Uh, I'm Jim Ostell, and I'm going to be <clears throat> talking about a database that we've started working on here at, at the NCBI called the Gen Info Backbone. Um, and Dennis has, uh, has set me up for this talk marvelously um, because uh, this database is actually meant to address a number of the issues that he, he raised in his talk. Um, so, you know, a number of the ideas I'm presenting, uh, I'm going to be criticizing some things about GenBank and PIR, but uh, I want you to realize that, you know, this is uh, an attempt to learn from experience. This is not meant to be uh, nasty to anybody. Um, and it's to demonstrate why we're doing some of the things we're doing with the backbone, um, which in many ways is uh, quite different from sequence databases that you, you've seen before. Okay, this is something called an entity relationship diagram. Um, what it is, each little box represents a data object in the database. And the, con and the lines between them are, are attempt to show the relationships between them. So I don't want to go into this in detail, but this is also part of the, the formal modeling approach. This is the entity relationship diagram for the backbone database. Someone who is a computer scientist could look at this and at least see what the basic layout of the database was. They might not understand why we're doing these things or, or that, but, but we have in fact recorded it in a formal way. Okay, so that brings us to implementation. How do we do this? <clears throat> well, one way we're doing it is by the definition of the backbone. It's stable, it represents the literature, it's well defined. But, but, but. Um, another is to try to standardize the way that we represent the information. Now this is a blow up of the journal line. This one's from that PIR file I showed you and this is from the GenBank file. Now if you read this as a human, you right away can determine, well, it's the same citation. But if you were a computer, computers are extremely stupid. They, and so if I were to match this string with this string, they don't match. This has an L, this doesn't have an L. This has dots between USA, this one doesn't. <clears throat> as far as a computer's concerned, those are different journal citations. Um, and it's not just that. I mean, here, you know, the year comes before uh, the volume and the pages. Here it comes afterwards. Uh, here there's a, a comma after the volume. Here there's a colon. Um, so unless these databases tell you that they're going to do it this way, um, and they always do it that way, which they don't, um, and they tell you that this string of letters really is the same as this one. They're not different journals. Um, you couldn't automatically make the connection between these two. Um, at the NCBI, we are actually, there are people working very hard building a large set of rather intelligent software that looks at these things and tries to figure out when they're the same, um, based on all sorts of rules and tables of which things could be the same and that sort of stuff. Um, this is clearly a problem. Uh, and something as simple as a journal citation, if you can't get that right, then we start to talk about things like relationships between sequences and promoters and diseases. Forget it. There's no way we're going to get this together. Um, so we have opted for representing data in something called ASN1. Um, ASN1 is abstract syntax notation 1. Uh, okay, so ASN1 is a language for describing any kind of data object in a way that's independent of how you implement it. That is, it's independent of a particular programming language or a particular database or anything like that. Um, and so that, in a sense, gives you the bridge. Uh, and it, it's here now. I mean, it exists. It's been around for a few years. Uh, it's a formal syntax, which means all those things. Um, it's consistent. It's machine readable and writable. And it, it enforces a clear specification of ideas. This is very important. Um, you know, especially in biology, we tend to really used to being able to deal with a very fuzzy world. We have to deal with a fuzzy world. You don't know all the things about everything that we're interested in. But a computer has to at least know what your assumptions are. <clears throat> they have to know that if you refer to the object person, you mean a social security number, a last name, a first name, a middle initial. I mean, we can say person, and we all kind of know what it is, but computer isn't going to know that. And so, this has turned out to be um, very useful because, in a sense, it really forces you to write down what you're willing to accept and what you believe. Um, 
okay, it's machine and implementation independent. That is, it separates the information from any particular piece of software or database. And that's really important. In other words, there's a, there's a clear separation between the data and access to the data. We can have lots of different kinds of access and uses to the data that all have a common uh, understanding of the information. Um, so it permits sharing, therefore, of data objects. That is, at NCBI, for instance, we have an ASN1 definition for what is a publication. Since we're the National Library of Medicine, probably most people will be willing to just use that. Um, and so there's a big win there because, number one, there's it, software that deals with publications then can become standardized. Maybe software that deals with promoters can't right now, but we can start building a body of reusable tools so you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time you do something. Um, it also permits the migration of the data as the technologies change. That is, we're using relational databases now because they're the current hot thing to use in computer science and there's lots of reasons for it. But there's, there's also a lot of limitations to that technology. There's no reason to believe it'll be around forever. And so if we don't want to lose everything we did in the relational databases, we want to provide ourselves a, a path where we can take the information that we've stored in a relational database and move it to the next generation database. And, um, and that's what this allows us to do. So in conclusion, this is the overview view of the GenInfo Backbone database. In terms of what's actually happening, um, the scientific, all the scientific literature being indexed by Medline is currently being tagged if it contains sequence data. Anything that contains sequence data, once it becomes part of Medline, the journals are rooted over to specialty indexers who, work, um, who are part of the library but work with us. Um, and they take the sequence information out of that and put it into the GenInfo backbone. And then this is meant to show those databases on top, a chromosome database, specialty uh, promoter database, a DNA structure, protein structure database. Um, they can now build, build on top of the backbone um, independently of each other. And then because we have well-defined now connections and ways of traversing this information space, one can write access software. Lots of people can write access software, not just us, because it's well-specified, um, which integrate all these different things, including the backbone itself, as well as these top-level databases, into a single coherent user view, which provides the, the synthesis of all these disparate sources. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.